and child carpet weaver from India to join up with the former football stitchers of Pakistan. Sialkot, the world's football manufacturing capital, was once the symbol of child exploitation in Asia, and it was considered fitting that the children of the Global March should take a symbolic stand here. The children are on their way to lobby the International Labour Organization in Geneva with a plea to bring in laws which would stop the enslavement of children and guarantee them the privilege of education. Fialcott claims it's a model town in this respect. Its politicians and industrialists have tackled the problem head-on and are actively banning child labor from the area. And they say their experience should be seen as an example throughout the developing world. But how much of this is just posturing in so much hot air? The town does indeed give the impression of model working conditions Neat tiers of adult football stitchers arranged in teams of apprentice, intermediate and master craftsmen, and not a child in sight. The Sialcot, which makes 80% of the world's match-grade balls, it's little short of a revolution. Two years ago, this region in northeast Pakistan became notorious when journalists and human rights organizations found children as young as eight sewing footballs for as little as 20 pence a ball. They suffered calloused hands, back pain, and the risk of being stabbed by dirty needles, and all for some of the best-known names in the business. Life was very busy. I'd go to school for an hour, then I would have to look after our cattle, water them, make sure they had enough to eat. Then I would have to sew footballs for the rest of the day. The main manufacturer in the area, Saga, responsible for a fifth of football exports, including the Nike and Mitre labels, appointed a former Save the Children employee to direct a corporate policy of compassionate change. Football stitching has traditionally been a home-based industry for reasons of costs. But uh, in the past few years, we recognized that it was not safe having football stitched in homes where we could have children participate in the uh, labor force. And I think we have to thank the international media and our human rights friends for pointing this out to us. Responding to consumer outrage, the main manufacturers and even the International Football Federation said they wouldn't tolerate the idea that children in Pakistan were suffering to provide the means of leisure for the West. Children had to be laid off and all football production was to be an adult-only activity. The situation here in Sialkot has without doubt improved dramatically over the last two years. But as with so many problem-solving ventures in the developing world, the solutions have created new problems. For a start, there are the women. Out of respect for Muslim traditions, the manufacturers have built handsome new premises separated from the men. But the women used to sew balls between performing household chores and childcare. Anxious not to upset their employers, they told me in private that they would prefer to work from home. Okay. Then there are the former child stitches. What to do with them? There is so far only one school in Sialkot, specifically for the rehabilitation of child workers, although many more are promised. But even these lucky few are unsure of their good fortune. I want to earn money for my parents. If I don't work, they'll have to borrow money to feed us, and then they will get into debt. By Pakistani standards, these children are privileged. Only the rich can normally afford to send their children to good schools. But the trouble is, the parents of child football stitchers are not rich, which is why their children were required to sew footballs in the first place. If children can't sew footballs, they're likely to go to a surgical instrument workshop. These children inhale metal dust, damage their hands, and sit in cramped and crippling positions. It's a huge industry in Sialkot, second only to footballs, exporting some $15 million worth of goods a year. Go to India's Uttar Pradesh across the border, and you could be in Pakistan two years ago except that these balls bear the insignia of this year's World Cup. The rates are much the same, about 12 rupees or 20 pence a ball, and the whole family is involved. 
The village middlemen are wary of do-gooders. They don't tell their workers where the balls are going or who are the manufacturers. Having learned from the experience of media attention in Pakistan, the brand names now get stamped on the balls at the factory. We are sewing for the World Cup, not that we'll get anything extra. We'll only get the normal rate. The profit from these World Cup balls will go to the big companies. FIFA, the International Football Association, who called for the ban on child stitches in Pakistan two years ago, said to my findings in India, our main preoccupation is with the World Cup this year, and we can't go scouring the world for instances of children stitching footballs. Their spokesman added that these balls were bound to be unofficial and condemned the manufacturers as irresponsible. It's not known how many companies, official or otherwise, operate in India because, like in Pakistan before the changes, they operate through middlemen and subcontractors. Upala Banerjee, the author of a scathing report on football stitching in India last year, could only take me to a few village workshops. The manufacturers won't allow her near the main stitching towns. She says that in terms of reform, India is years behind Pakistan. And if outside agencies come and try and tackle the problem of India's estimated 20,000 football stitches, they must learn from Pakistan's mistakes. A total ban on sports, child labor in sports goods in India would not be a very welcome initiative for the very simple reason that children in India work especially in sports goods. I'm not talking about other sport industries like say carpet industry. That's a very hazardous form of industry. Child labor, but say children in sports goods is not hazardous. I've seen children stitching football. But as long as they go to school, come back, stitch two or three footballs, and supplement their parents' income. And more importantly, it would force them into going into more hazardous forms of child labor and be more exploited in return. In Pakistan, it's surgical instruments. Here in India, it's working in the tanneries. Children as young as eight are handling animal skins in these foul-smelling workplaces. Children under 15 aren't allowed to work in so-called hazardous industries, and I had to film secretly to get these pictures. It's a salutary tale, showing that the arrogance of the West in assuming problem-solving powers can risk making them worse. Those of us who want to help fight child exploitation should bear in mind work like this before calling for a ban on work like this.